I'll do a, a very brief introduction um, to kind of begin things. So Michael Lister, we're so excited to have you on our Zoom author talk to talk about both your writing process, your John Jordan series, and your, your um, quarantine book, The Blood Pathogens. So um, I wanted to welcome, welcome you and everyone who is in participating. And um, we are recording as well, but the, cha the chat as well as names will not be on the recording, but welcome everyone. So cool to be able to do this. Some of my uh, fondest memories related to having books published and, and meeting readers is in the Bay County Library. And I, I've lost track of how many events I've done there over the years, but it's been a lot over my 20, 23, 24 year career. Um, and the, the library has been so supportive and I, I, I don't know where we would be without libraries and I'm so grateful. Um, I, I feel like I live in a library, <laughs> own, but libraries are just so important. And I especially want to thank Sarah for doing this. Thanks for including me and I really appreciate it. I always like to learn about the creative process, so so I can't wait to hear. I think maybe I'll start there with the creative process and talk about the quarantine a little bit and then get into the books. Um, as I'm talking, though, if you please feel free to jump in if you have any, if I have any questions or anything, Sarah, if I need to know anything, just jump in and let me know. But um, it's interesting for someone like me because the, the pandemic and the quarantine didn't change my work. It didn't change the way I work, you know, and I feel like it's probably possible that introverts have probably done better, you know, through the quarantine than, than extroverts have. We are used to being alone and like it, like being alone. We enjoy our own company. We enjoy the company of a good book. Um, the biggest thing that has changed for me is the social things. Uh, one of the things I have always enjoyed the most is dinner with friends, you know, whether it's, and mostly going out. I love going to restaurants, uh, to a good Thai place or a steakhouse and just sitting and visiting over a good meal. And that, that's been the, the biggest loss. Uh, and this is, as an adult, this is the longest stretch of time I've ever gone without eating out because that was just such a big part of my social life. So I miss that. I miss being able to hug people. Um, although when we both have masks and we turn to the side, I've been, I've gotten back to hugging my closest friends and family now. And, uh, but you know, it was a long time without that. And that touch and connection was is such a loss. But in terms of my creative life and, and the work I do, if anything, I've been able to do more. You know, there's been less distractions. There's been less opportunity to go out and do things. And so I probably have written slightly more. Um, I stay on a pretty um, set schedule. And so I, I write a lot. And I, I, when I'm writing a book, I write every day. Every first thing I do when I get up in the morning is write. And then I write throughout the day and sometimes into the evening and late at night in between other things, in between, you know, family and friends and activities and things that I have to do. But so I, I've maintained that for, you know, over 20 years now. And that hasn't changed except that in the evenings, uh, I, I still go to the gym. Uh, I have a, a, a basketball league and pickup league that I play in and, so I've, I've been doing that some, um, still time with, with family, but like I said, there's less time to go out and do things. Um, we can't go to movies, you know, we can't go to library events. We can't go to concerts or, you know, out to eat. So some of that time has been allowed me to, to write even more, which I'm grateful for as much as I'm ready for this pandemic to be over and for us to get back to some of those activities and things we were doing prior to this starting. Um, I have tried to do my best to take advantage of it, of the time. And in, usually in life, uh, if we will accept what is instead of fighting against it, you know, I think my, and I think most people's biggest issues is when rather than accepting what is and finding the peace and dealing with what is, 
we, if when we fight against it is when we're actually fighting against ourselves and fighting against the flow of life. Um, and every, every challenge is also an opportunity. So every, every, aspect of the challenges that the pandemic has brought us has also allowed for opportunities and like i said for me one of them was more creative time more focus uh, more stillness more quiet and solitude and things that are extremely beneficial but um some of us don't take advantage of those until they're almost forced on us and so anyway that's my little uh pandemic quarantine lifestyle and how it's been going so i think i'll transition into the books and i'll i'll probably jump around and i want to talk about sort of the series as a whole or maybe even sort of what i write about and then key in on blood pathogen and um even the the new in a blood red sky uh, beneath the blood red sky which comes out in october um <clears throat> i grew up loving stories um you know i i going back to childhood I really was always interested in crime and mysteries. Uh, you know, started with Sherlock Holmes and the Hardy Boys and um, uh, Encyclopedia Brown, you know, those kind of as a kid. Um, and I was also interested in theology and psychology and some of those kind of things. And I went to uh, seminary and I have two degrees in theology, but it was actually in my undergraduate degree, the literary class, the, the literature class that, um, where I really got turned on to fiction, I had been reading nonfiction in, the, in these areas that I mentioned that I was interested in for, for years at that point, but I had only read a little bit of fiction and more so in childhood than I did during adolescence. And I just fell in love with fiction. I fell in love with poetry, actually, and fiction, and the use of language to convey emotion and feeling and thoughts and ideas and and humanity, really, to that that sharing, exchanging of of humanity. And so it was in as a teenager. Still, I guess I was probably nineteen um, at the time. Is when I fell in love with with fiction, and I. I since I already liked mysteries and crime fiction, I, I uh, as a kid, I gravitated toward that. So I started reading some of the hardball detectives. Robert B. Parker was was a favorite from the jump. I, I loved him and his writing style, his characters. And then, of course, way leads to way. And so you start with one and it leads you into others. And around that time, I, I discovered uh, Andrew Greeley, who was writing a ecclesiastical sleuth uh, kind of series. And uh, Father Brown, uh, G.K. Chesterton created the, the whole notion of a clerical, a cleric, a, a minister who is also a detective. And that was back in 1911 with Father Brown. And there's been a lot of priests and ministers, nuns, imams, rabbis that have solved crime since then. But as far as I could tell, there had never been one put in a hard-boiled detective novel, sort of a modern crime, crime novel. And so that's what I wanted to do because I loved both of those things and I wanted to bring them together. I also love the Southern tradition of storytelling and a, a literary approach where you care about the language. It's not just conveying the story or the ideas or the characters, but you really take time for how the language sounds, how it feels, how it looks on the page. And also during this time or shortly, I guess it was a little after I graduated, from college, and that's how I was, you know, immersing myself into all this literature. I also discovered James Lee Burke, who writes the Dave Robichaux novels. And so that's, that's where my early inspiration came from. Robert B. Parker and Father Brown and Sherlock Holmes and Dave Robichaux. Um, all of those things were swirling around when I started writing. Also, then when I started writing, I became a full time prison chaplain. And so I, I wanted to use a prison chaplain as a character. I wanted him to be an ex cop and have law enforcement in his background and in the series eventually become a law enforcement officer again. And the two cases that were dominating, true crime cases that were dominating the media and the culture when I first started writing. 
on researching and getting ready to start this series was the O.J. Simpson trial and the JonBenet Ramsey case. And so all of that is sort of the background of where I started. And my first book, uh, Power in the Blood, was uh, published in 1997 by uh, Pineapple Press, a, a publisher down in South Florida in Sarasota. Uh, had a tr fantastic experience with them and, and having this published. And I had, uh, it came out in 1997. I started writing it in the summer of 94. And like I said, I was a prison chaplain at the time. I was getting to live my research every day and, and was just every single day given ideas and, and uh, experiences that I thought would make for a really good, good novel uh, and ultimately a good series, hopefully. I, um, it was the first thing I ever wrote, first fiction, first, first novel. And so on the 20th anniversary, I actually went back and rewrote it. So I uh, was happy, I was proud of it as a first book, but it was very much a first book. And so I had the opportunity to redo it. And I didn't write the book I would, you know, 20 years later, nor did I write the one I did 20 years before. I did a combination of those. So I kept most of what's in here, but I re-edited it. I actually uh, added some subplots. And, and so it's a, to me, it's a really a whole new book. So if you haven't read the new anniversary edition of Power in the Blood, I definitely recommend that. And I think um, if you like the series, I think you'll really love the new, new edition. But uh, that came out in 97. I was still a full-time prison chaplain. And I uh, remained a full-time chaplain until 2000, so for three more years, and then I started writing full-time in 2000. I have been uh, writing full-time since then. This is my, how I make my daily bread, and um, I, when I first made the transition, I had to do some different types of writing to, to pay the bills, so I wrote for newspapers, and I wrote screenplays. But then as uh, time went on, by about 2004 or five, I was able to just do novel writing. Maybe it was a little later, but anyway. And so for the last several years, I've just focused on writing. I've written uh, some standalone thrillers. Uh, the most popular has been Double Exposure. And uh, it's, uh, it's been called a, a prose poem. It's, it's very lyrical and a, a style that's different from most of the other things that I write. Um, I've written uh, probably three or four thrillers. They're just, just, they're related to the series. Some characters go back and forth, but, but they are, they are thrillers in their own right versus mostly what I write are mysteries and mostly what I write are in one series. And so this John Jordan mystery series, uh, I'm working on the 25th book in that series now. Uh, that's Beneath the Blood Red Sky that'll come out in October. So, but it started in 97 and I have gotten to really write about the arc of this character, John Jordan, and the other series characters throughout a lifetime. And I hope to continue doing that for my entire life. Uh, that's certainly my plan. I have never had an issue with coming up with ideas or wanting to, um, uh, you know, like searching or scrambling for ideas. I, at this point, I've done it so long, I trust the process, I know that they'll come. There is a big difference though between an idea and an inspiration to me. I think ideas are easy and I have ideas all the time as, as everyone does, but there's something different about an inspiration. Inspiration is bigger, I think, it's deeper, it lasts longer, because if you're gonna take this inspiration, this idea, and it is going to sustain writing an entire novel and keep you interested in a way that hopefully then the reader will also be interested, then it really takes something more than just an idea. It's an inspiration that leads to, you know, just a multiplicity of ideas that just sort of branch off in, in many, many different directions. Um, there's been some highlights over the series. I wanna just mention a few and then I will talk about blood pathogen. Uh, the first one I would have to say is not only the being a prison chaplain and bringing that real life experience to the series with power in the blood and blood of the lamb, but, um, and the body in the blood, but the first sort of big hallmark, uh, for me in the series. And I think for many readers is I did a, in the sixth book is a prequel. So after spending several novels with John in his current life, 
readers get to go back and see how things started for him. And it actually goes back to the Atlanta child murders. Those are, that's a case that has fascinated me for a very long time. I feel a connection to it. I lived in Atlanta. Um, I did research while I was there. I had connections to people who were connected to the, the case. And it's one of those that is uh, not solved. You know, there's aspects of it that are solved. But when you think about the irony that the Atlanta child murderer, and that is his designation, has never been charged with or convicted for killing a single child just for two adults. And so, and I'm not saying he didn't, that Wayne Williams did not kill some of the children that are on the list of 30 something that it depends on whose list you go by. But um, it was just, there's just a lot of questions still. There's a lot that's unsolved. Um, there's many of the victims on that list that were not killed, in my opinion, not killed by Wayne Williams. And I feel like those should be considered open and unsolved. And so I delve into that. And that, that book is called uh, Innocent Blood. And we meet John as a 12 year old. He's vacationing with his family at the Omni in Atlanta. And he in the game room actually has a confrontation with Wayne Williams. And many of the victims went missing from the, the Omni and from the arcade that was there. Many of them lived around that area. So uh, that really began a foray for me into true crime and bringing true crime into my fictional crime series. And I, in some ways, I will bring an actual true crime case and investigate it, like the Atlanta child murders, like the John Bernie Ramsey case, like uh, Ted Bundy, and many others. But sometimes then I'll just use them as inspiration and they will lead to a, a fictionalized version that was inspired, that inspires a, an entirely fictional novel. Um, the Maura Murray case inspired Cold Blood and there's a lot of similarities. Um, Columbine and what happened uh, with many of the school shootings around the country inspired uh, Bloodshot, which is, um, I'm sorry, Bloodshed, which is, there it is right there. It's uh, to me one of the um, highlights of the series and one of the more or most important books in there. I'm, I'm really um, tackling or dealing with school shootings uh, was just something that um, I felt really passionately about and felt like needed to be done. And I, with all of my novels, I try to make them very engaging, entertaining page turners that you're thrilled and you, you want to, you want to get through it. You want to see who did it. You want to, you, you you have the, the, in, the experience of entertainment, but also there's more. And so there's social issues, there's issues related to criminal justice system and, and everything else. So um, sort of related to that two, I think two years ago, I wrote a novel called Blue Blood. This is about a um, police shooting of an arm, unarmed black man. Well, at the time, that was uh, certainly you know in the news and, and it's been a reality for a long time. But to me, this book is more relevant today with what's going on in the country than ever before. And uh, I really, again, it's a murder mystery. There's a lot that goes on. I think this, hopefully it's page turning and thrilling, but I do get to delve into our social justice issues and law enforcement and policing and, and community issues and racism and, and, you know, a lot of things like that. So, and then more locally, um, when Hurricane Michael hit a few years back, I was actually, it's interesting, I was finishing up Blue Blood. And in those first days after the hurricane, I kept my same writing schedule. And so with the generator, I would charge the computer at night. And then during the day, I would open the window and it was so hot. I was just sitting here sweating uh, and I could hear the chainsaws and all the stuff that was going around. And in the afternoons and evenings, I would go out and help with cleanup and help. But it, I kept my morning writing schedule. So I would be in here writing finishing up Blue Blood, but as I was doing that, with every word I was writing, I knew I had to write about the hurricane. I knew that Hurricane Michael, because this series is sort of taking place in real time and is involving real life situations and circumstances, I had to include Hurricane Michael. I don't like that that was his name, but um, uh, this is called And the, the Sea Became Blood, 
And then I wrote a sequel, a specific sequel, hurricane related sequel to it called The Blood Dimmed Tide. And those are my two Hurricane Michael books. And they're murder mysteries and thrillers that happen on the in the back on the with the backdrop of the hurricane and the devastation it did, you know, to our, our community. Um, I mentioned true crime, a couple other recent books, and then I'll I'll be done before I get to blood pathogen is uh, the Madeline McCann case has always fascinated me. And there's a fantastic documentary on Netflix. Uh, I think it's called The Disappearance of Madeline McCann, but it's something like that. But my novel Blood and Sand was inspired by that case by, uh, you know, parents who lose a small child under strange circumstances. And in, in their case, they're actually vacationing at a resort. And um, as, uh, as is always the case, suspicion fell on them, and, you know, instantly. Um, but that was a, a really uh, interesting novel to write and to delve into that. And then even more recently, I wrote a novel called Blood Lure, which is based on the Lost Girls of Panama, another f fascinating case. And with, with so many of these real life cases, they're, they're set all around the world, but I try to find a way to bring them to North Florida, bring them to John Jordan's territory so that he can work cases that are similar or related. And then that brings us to my most recent, which is blood pathogen. And there again, just like with the hurricane, the moment the pandemic started, I knew I wanted to write about it. Uh, excuse me. And in ways I knew I needed to write about it. I knew it would be therapeutic and helpful, beneficial. And I knew it, it worked out schedule wise that I could write it while it was happening. The, the, the pandemic was unfolding and I was writing the book as it was happening. So Blood Pathogen came out uh, in, in the spring or I, I guess maybe early summer, maybe June, I can't remember, but, um, but it, it's a murder mystery and it's actually in many ways inspired by some classic murder mysteries that uh, like Agatha Christie wrote. It involves uh, the Tupelo Queens. It's a group of uh, uh, singers, actors, uh, actresses who um, have spent their whole life entertaining uh, and one by one, they're being picked off. They're being killed. And um, it's on the backdrop of the pandemic and what's happening in the world. And so it's a murder mystery to solve and, and hopefully a, a whodunit that is, you get to the end and it's surprising and yet inevitable, hopefully. That's certainly what I go for. But it's also dealing with the realities of the pandemic and what social distancing and quarantine meant for a murder investigation. And so it was a lot of fun to write. Um, I had some readers say, yeah, I just don't know if I can read something about what I'm living right now. It's too, it's too raw, it's too real, it's too soon. But many of those same readers said it was a great diversion because the pandemic is just the backdrop. It's just what's going on in the world behind what's actually happening with the, the murder mystery. Uh, finally, I'll just mention that the one I'm working on now is called Beneath the Blood Red Sky. And when I finished Blood Pathogen, as usually is my case, I take some time to stop writing and recharge, refresh, you know, renew, and then I start doing research. And at that point, sometimes when I'm in the middle of a book, like Blue Blood, I knew that uh, that a, a Sea Became Blood would be next. But sometimes I finish a book and I don't know what's next. I don't have the next inspiration or ideas. And so I was just opening myself up to inspiration and I just started researching true crime and I found a case that was just so inspiring. And uh, so many times when I pick a true crime case, it's because it's unsolved or because there's a real mystery at the heart of it. Sometimes there's many mysteries, like in the case of Maura Murray, there are many mysteries inside the main mystery. And this case was, was very similar to that. And usually I do all uh, a ton of research before I ever start writing. And then as I'm writing, I'll continue to do research. And then when I finish the book and it comes out, a lot of times I will share with my readers what true crime case inspired it. And I'll talk to them about it and, and have that whole aspect and, uh, of the experience of reading the book. This time I decided to reverse that order. And so I actually started a group so that the any reader who wanted to could join me in the investigation of the real life case we do that together and then when we finish our investigation and we've come up with all our theories and we've you know done our best to solve the case then they'll get to read 
beneath a blood red sky and see how I fictionalized the case and what I did with it and the conclusions I reached and who I think did it, which will be very different than the discussions in the, in the group. Uh, so that's, uh, that's called Solve a Mystery with Michael Lister. And uh, it's been going for three weeks now, I think it is. And it'll, it'll go until the book comes out in October. And uh, each week we watch videos and listen to podcasts and share our thoughts and ideas and answer questions and, and have exchanges of information about the real life case, which I still hasn't, I haven't mentioned to the general public what that case is. And I don't plan on doing that until the book comes out. And then the, those who are in the group will already, you know, know, but everyone else will find out at, at that point. So that's uh, that's all I had in mind to share. I'd be happy to answer any questions, but again, thank you so much for having me and letting me share about these books that I love so much. I always learn new things about your creative process each time we have you on um, for a library program. So what I'll do is I'll start from the beginning and, and uh, work my way down. Uh, one question is that um, from Holly, she prefers to read physical books rather than ebooks, and they're hard to find. Uh, where do you usually recommend people to purchase your titles? So obviously the, the easiest place for most readers is Amazon. And I should say, and I meant to mention this when I was talking, that all of my books are available in hardcover, paperback, ebook, and most of them now are available in audiobook. Oh, audio wow. is the largest growing segment of publishing and of the 25 i think all of my other titles uh my standalone thrillers are already in audiobook of the 25 john jordan mysteries over half are now audiobooks and within the next year or so all of them will be so if you like audio i love audiobooks i'm always listening to a book uh, when i'm doing other things like you know exercising or cleaning or whatever it happens to be driving so um i'm thrilled that they're an audiobook and uh kyle tate is the narrator he's done such a fantastic job but anyway so i recommend amazon as a easy place most people already set up and can you know uh, get books that way but you can also get them from my website michaellister.com you can order them there and i can sign them for you and and they'll be shipped to you if you like a, a signed you know autographed book but otherwise you know you can get them from any bookstore but the online stores are the mostly have them in stock and ready to go. Most, um, and, and the reason I mentioned, you know, Amazon or my website is the question was where to purchase. Obviously the library is mm -hmm. a great place to get, to pick up your books. And I will say that with my uh, audio book listens that readers are listening to, um, my, you know, they, my listens, people, readers who are listening as opposed to reading a physical book or, or an ebook have really gone up. And the vast majority of those are through the library, you know, cause I get a report of where people are listening and the vast, vast majority are at, through their library all over the world. So I hope Bay County has my audio books. And like I say, every month, a new one is coming online. So Deborah says she loves reading double exposure in her class and students always ask her, Will there ever be a John Jordan without the word blood in the title? Well, no, I don't believe so. I'm not, yeah, I can't say never. Uh, you never know what's going to happen. But there are two or three short story novellas that don't have blood in the title. Um, there's a couple that deal with uh, John's wedding and Meryl's wedding. Oh. And um, what's the other one? Anyway, a couple other things that just were like a novella in between that sort of falls in between the novels to tell us a, a, a certain story. Most of those really aren't even uh, murder mysteries. They're just sort of connective stories, you know, like I say, weddings or special events. Christmas is one of them. Um, so they don't have blood in the title, but the rest of them do have blood in the title. And it's one of those things that so far I have not had to stretch for any blood titles. There's so many great titles with the word blood and I still have a, very long list of ones that that I can still use. So I know other authors have started series and they've tried to use the same. Uh, some use colors, some use certain words, you know, um, numbers uh, like what well, Stephanie, uh, the, is it Stephanie Plum, is that her name? Or uh, anyway, uh, may, I may be yeah. making the author and the character name together. I'm not it sure. Does. But and then Sue Grafton did the, the alphabet. 
you know, A is for alibi and that kind of thing. But it does help, I think, to connect, help readers know that books are connected in a series. I will also say, though, it can also be confusing. And with every title having blood in it, it's easy to lose. It's easy to lose track of a long series anyway. And I know that can be confusing. And I, I don't, you know, I don't really know of a way around it. But I've been very pleased because when I, when I named Power in the Blood, I wasn't even positive it was going to be a series. And I wasn't thinking. I just thought Power in the Blood brought together crime and the religious aspects of uh, John as a prison chaplain. But over the years, like I say, I've, I've, there's been no shortage of inspirational titles with the word blood in them. So I plan on continuing to do that. And I, I cheated and Googled what the author was. So it's Janet Ivanovich, Ivanovich and, and Stephanie, Stephanie Plum's, Plum's the character. character. <laughs> and so she really enjoyed the real-time feel of reading Blood Pathogen. Cool. Thank you. Elise is interested in joining the group with um, the the mystery solving investigative team. It, I should have said, excuse me, it's not too late to get into that. And if you go to my website, the information is there and uh, you can easily join. And the way we've got it is when you join, you'll be invited to, you'll be able to join the group. And then it's, uh, you get the, your copy of the book, as, you know, actually mm. before it's published more widely or broadly, you get it when we finish the investigation. So. If you join that group, not only can you participate in the investigation, which is, you know, very interesting. And, and I hate, I hate to say it this way, but I mean, it, it, there is, it is true that it's fun. Investigating is fun and it, there's tragedy and there's horror and there's, you know, victims and there's their families that are grieving. And so I'm not making a light of that, but there are a lot of us that enjoy the puzzle, enjoy the search and the, the, you know, we're drawn to mysteries, I think, because life itself is a mystery, you know, and <clears throat> death is a mystery. And if there's an afterlife is a mystery and, you know, how we got here, everything is, there's so many mysteries in life. I think that's why we're drawn to mysteries and by, why we enjoy them. So when I say I, it's fun or I enjoy true crime, I don't, I'm not making light of the suffering that goes along with the, the victims and their families in any way. But there is an aspect to in the investigation part, not their tragedy, but the investigation part that is entertaining and fun sometimes. So. And there's been more citizen investigators, I feel, in recent years, um, kind of teaming up, like, they'll be gone in the dark kind yes. of covers with Michelle McNamara and the whole uncovering of a whole case because of citizen detectives. So, You're so how crazy right. would that be if you guys solved the case? You know, think about what we're doing right now and the technology involved and there's people all over the world or could be that are joining us. I know some from Canada and different parts of this, our country, the, the new technology, the new connection of social media allows for the citizen detective to join together and solve cases. And it's already happened. We've had cases solved by citizen detectives. We've also had many cases solved because of the pressure of the investigation of citizen detectives. Sometimes it rattles the suspects and they confess. Sometimes it causes law enforcement to take another look at a case that they had sort of given up on. Sometimes we uncover, uncover new information and we share that and the authorities use it. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a really wonderful time to be living if you're a true crime fan. The true crime podcasts are just, there's so many of them, they're so, so good. Um, uh, speaking of, I should mention, I was a guest on the Missing Maura Murray podcast last week, so you can check that out. So that's a great podcast. Tim and Lance do such a good job, and that's such a fascinating case. Um, but anyway, I talked to them, and we had a really good discussion. I recommend that. But um, in addition to the, you mentioned Michelle McNamara's book about the Golden State Killer. Think about that was solved. That had everything to do with the work she did and the people who joined her. And yes, she passed away before it was solved and before the book came out. It's an excellent book, by the way. I highly recommend it to everyone. I would also say HBO did a phenomenal documentary about it that's, that's also really good. And then related to that and related to Citizen Detectives, one of the investigators that helped Michelle so much wrote a, a book called Chase Darkness with me, I think is, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm doing it from memory, but he actually really explores, you, are you able to look it up? He's exploring what citizen detectives can do together. And he actually sets a framework for um, 
citizen detectives working together, taking a sort of oath of, you know, how to go about doing it and sharing information. And did I get the title right or am I mixing up? You uh, got it. It's um, Chasing Darkness With Me, How One True Crime Writer Started Solving Murders. And it's um, Billy Jensen. Billy Jensen. Billy he Jensen. also, Billy Jensen is phenomenal. Great, great writer and person and investigator. He also has a really good true crime podcast. So I recommend that book and his podcast very, very highly. Yeah, I've been with listening to the Murder Squad as well. Nice, yeah. And that's, uh, does, does Paul Holes work with him on that one? Uh-huh, that... yeah, it's the two of them. Just, just great investigators, and they have such a wealth of knowledge and experience and bring to, you know, an average citizen who can help out, you know, if they are so inclined. We have another question. Who are your favorite authors? I have many, 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 but I'll talk about just a few that are not just favorites, but have inspired me. Uh, I mentioned Robert B. Parker and James Lee Burke. I don't know if I tilt this up, if you can see, but there's a picture of them on, can you see that? The frame picture, right? That's the two of them right there. Uh, they've been just hugely influential. Uh, Michael Connolly is another uh, favorite mentor friend that I just have so much respect for. And um, like, uh, you know, James Lee Burke and uh, Robert B. Parker, once I was published and was starting to speak at mystery conferences and things, these are people I got to meet and to thank in person for their influence on me. Uh, Parker passed away, I think in 2010, it's hard to believe it was that long ago, but um, to be able to tell him what an influence he had been was a tremendous treat. Uh, I love Dennis Lehane's writing. Uh, he doesn't do the uh, mystery series, crime fiction series anymore. He, he does standalones now, but he's a fantastic writer. Love his work. Um, Walter Mosley is uh, the Easy Rowling series, Rowling's the e series especially, but all his writing is, is really, really good. Um, of course, I like the classics. I love Agatha Christie. I absolutely adore her and, and her writing. And she's the best, the hands down, no question, the best mystery plotter that's ever lived. Um, and obviously I'm stating that like it's a fact, it's my opinion, but I'm gonna say it, say it like it's a fact because I really do believe it. And I think it's generally acknowledged. And I feel like she gets uh, a bad rap for her writing. I think she's a better writer than most people give her credit for. Um, and then I, uh, other classics, Raymond uh, Chandler, and Dashiell Hammett, going back to the sort of birth of the hardball detective, absolutely love and adore them. Uh, Ernest Hemingway uh, has been a, a big influence, really like him and his uh, style. And then there's so many others I could, I could keep going, but I probably should stop there. Although I'll, I'll may, may mention two more that are, have, that are not fiction, but spiritually, uh, intellectually, spiritually, psychologically, uh, developmentally, human development, uh, two of the biggest writers that have inspired me are Frederick Buechner and Thomas More. And they both write spiritual, you know, sort of self-help books, but uh, are just, uh, to me, such deep, deep people and share just such profound, profound things. So I'll stop. I could keep going because there's so many, but those are some of my favorites that are also uh, inspirations. We have a question on, do you have the ending in mind when you begin a novel or what is the kind of chronological As a process? novice, when I first started, a lot of times I didn't. And it's okay to do it that way, but usually you do a lot of rewriting if that's the case and you will write yourself in the corners and take a while to figure out how to get out. I've learned for me that what works best is knowing a good bit about the characters and knowing how the book starts, you know, what that inciting incident is that sort of propels it forward and knowing the ending in a way. It is very, um, it's not solid. It's still, you know, so much will change and move, but yes, I do know who I think is going to wind up having done the, the murder. 
And I usually know a few key points along the way, and that's enough to get me started. And I feel like knowing that and being a discovery writer, which is what I am, when I get up in the morning and rush to the, the keyboard, I don't know what's going to happen in the book that day. I have some ideas, but I, I but I'm so anxious to get there to find out what's going to happen next that I feel like, and my hope is the reader will have that same experience, that it'll be seemingly seeming to unfold in real time. That'll be interesting and engaging. And, and again, page turning in a way that for me, if I plotted the entire thing out ahead of time, it wouldn't be. Now there are many people who do it successfully like that. And if you look at a, a director like uh, Alfred Hitchcock, he drew out every single frame and knew every single shot before he ever started shooting. And he's a master and he made some of the greatest films ever made. But I certainly, I would get bored. If I knew everything ahead of time, I would, I would get bored with the process. And I love, love writing, love finding out what's going to happen next. And so that's the way I do it. And uh, some people call it writing into the dark. Some people call it discovery writing. But there's a quote, um, and I, I'm sorry that I forget now who said it. Um, it's unfortunate. I shouldn't even bring it up if I can't tell you who said it. But a famous writer once said <laughs> that uh, writing a novel is like driving cross country at night, that you can see just what your headlights are illuminating. But that's all you need to be able to see in order to get all the way across the continent because all you need to know is what's happening right now, what's coming right next, and that's, that's how I write. And we have one more question. Um, have you ever temporarily assumed the identity of your character or characters? Well, now if you mean actually put myself in, the, I, I feel like the process of writing, which is similar to that of reading, where it in, involves a lot of empathy and compassion, because you do put yourself in the place of the character. And then to a certain extent, I feel like I have to do that with every character I'm writing, um, if I'm understanding the, the question right. Uh, but now, no, I've never created a, a fake a driver's license that says John Jordan and tried to, um, you know, get it, pass myself off as John Jordan somewhere and um, that kind of thing. But definitely every aspect of writing, you are embodying, you, you're doing the imaginative process of what is it like to be this other person and that's why to me i say that literature is one of the greatest teachers of compassion there is because i can actually be inside you and see what you're thinking and feel what you're feeling and look at your experiences and how they brought you to where you are even though they might be vastly different than mine and hopefully it enables me to have compassion for you for the character you know as uh, library staff, we always promote reading diverse characters as well to promote empathy. Absolutely. Um, and yes, that was, the question was answered. Do you write wearing your hat? <laughs> I guess occasionally I do. For the most part, I, I don't. I will say that um, I like hats and I wear a lot of hats, but I have, since the pandemic and lack of haircuts, <laughs> I've worn hats much more, uh, including inside and occasionally when I'm writing, but so far I've not worn one to bed. So when you're doing true crime, that can be hard to be in. So is there any cases that you've been researching that have been really hard to almost, I mean, you're kind of living it when you're researching or working on your story? Yeah, in, in a way, they're all difficult uh, emotionally you know when you think about it again if you're talking about the process of putting yourself in someone's place the greatest to me the single greatest and you know people are you can take issue with this this is just my opinion like everything else I'm saying but to me the the most horrific thing a person can experience in this life and there's a lot of them but it's the loss of your own child and when you're investigating a case like John Benet Ramsey, like Madeline, Madeline McCann, and different other ones where a, you feel the grief of a parent who is lost. I mean, I'm almost you know tearing up now because the the experience of that is just it's it's unreal. It's it's, it's really unimaginable, and yet I'm putting myself in the position of trying to imagine that and experience that and feel that, and it's. Uh, 
I think it's necessary for that the process, but it is extremely, extremely difficult. Um, then there are others where you encounter evil, like it's also seemingly unimaginable. I, there's cases where I'm looking at a certain killer, a certain type of killer, a certain uh, person who does certain things that I honestly stop and say, is it possible that this is a human being, that this, that this person is the same species as we are? It, it's, it's unimaginable. And yet that's what I'm doing is imagining what that's like. So I have definitely gotten in, in um, have a lot of uh, difficult, challenging experiences writing. I have gotten to the point where um, I have, um, you know, got dis gotten disturbed, gotten uh, frightened, fearful. Uh, you you can go down some of these rabbit holes and get, you know, paranoid and um, just where you're looking over your shoulder, you know, and making sure that that uh, firearm that you have for your protection is, is closer to you than it normally is just because of these places you're going. Um, but that's also why I usually take a break in between books and I have a diet of other, uh, you know, input, entertainment. Um, but I do love true crime. And when I was a prison chaplain, that was a dark job to do. And I dealt with a lot of darkness and you know, in addition to everything else, you, you, this, the whole environment of a prison is just oppressive. It's, there's so much wasted human potential there. There's so much depression and drug addiction and just just horrific things. And so you go into, and that's why there, there's such an increase of domestic violence and drug abuse among prison workers, correctional officers and the like. And in addition to all of that, I sat across my desk and heard the confessions of these men and what they did. Um, and so I learned then, or tried to learn how to process things, how to be able to light the darkness in and then, you know, get it right back out. And I tried my best not to bring it home with me. You know, my family would not, not I hope that I was no different when I was doing that job than I am now as a novelist, you know, as far as they're concerned and how I relate to them and, and everyone else. But I do think for uh, an investigator, law enforcement officer, anybody who's dealing with darkness, true crime reporter, whoever it happens to be, um, has to learn the process of processing darkness and, and exercising those demons and getting them out so you don't live with them and I, I guess what I mean, live under their influence where it alters you. And we have two comments to relate to that one. Um, Robert Lampier mentions that a person who loses a parent is an orphan. A person who loses a spouse is a widower and there's no word for a person who loses a child. That's it's not a supposed to happen. Delightful comment, yeah. That, anyway, what, there, there's no word sufficient for that, you know? And a similar um, question is, have you ever walked away from a difficult storyline? Maybe temporarily. Okay. Um, I think, uh, you know, the going back to children, um, I remember one of the very first uh, mystery conventions I was speaking at was on a panel. And there was a horror writer, a horror writer, and uh, I won't say his name, he's popular, everybody would, would, or many people would recognize him, but we were on the same panel together, several of us, and the question, I, for, I forget if it was from the moderator or the, the audience, but someone said, is there a subject you won't touch? And that horror writer who, I mean, he writes some horrific things, said he would not write about the death of a child. And Blood of the Lamb had just come out, and that involves the, you know, mystery of the death of this young child. So. Um, that's a dark place to go. Um, but if I, if I'm inspired to write about something, I usually stick with it, but there are times where I maybe step away from it temporarily. Have you gotten to any of our local unsolved crimes? Yes. In terms of, uh, just, uh, you know, reading about maybe investigating slightly, but not, not, not delving into them 
in an investigative way, like I'm doing this current case or like some of the others that I've done or, or been a part of. Um, my approach to writing crime novels is having consultants who are experts and who are investigators, who are sheriffs, who are attorneys, who are judges, who are forensic, you know, pathologists. And so I'm constantly asking them. So some of them are local or regional. And so when I ask them, a lot of times they'll refer to actual cases that have happened in the area. And then there's some that, um, that are, there have been books written about or that are enough in the public consciousness that, you know, most people know about them. Well, I, I, I won't, I won't name any cases by, uh, by name, but anyway, yes, I have some <laughs> and plan to do more. And we have one more. Um, Kathy says, greetings from Ireland. Just wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you for all the wonderful John Jordan series. I have read them all during lockdown and I can't wait to continue for a long, long time. Thank you so much, Kathy. Hello to you in Ireland. I appreciate you being a part of this. I, 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 the one, one of the local cases I wanted to mention, what, when, what I'll do is just recommend a book and it's very hard to find. And I wonder if the library has it. I bet you do. It's called Invitation to a Lynching. And it was written by, I believe, a Miami Herald reporter at the time. It's a, it's a very old book. Is it, and did it come out in the sixties or was it even? Stephanie early? five. It's Stephanie by five. E. C. Miller. And we have, we have some copies for checkout and some in our local history. So there are some that could be checked out. As you can see, if you look behind me and all the books I have, I've been a book collector for decades now. And I can tell you that was one of the most difficult books I ever had finding. Um, it took a while. It took me a couple of years to find that. And because uh, I, I could have gone to the library, but I wanted to own it. I wanted it to be a part of my library. And uh, it was very hard to find. So if, since the library has it, that's awesome. But I, I do recommend that one for a local case to read about. Jan says just to say hello from Israel and thank you for all the wonderful stories. So, so we're international today. That's awesome. All the perks of um, virtual programming. So thank you guys for joining us. Yeah, let me, if, if you don't mind, if I could just say again, how much I appreciate everyone joining us and how much that means, but also how much it means um, that someone would take the time to read my work. There's, you know, we live in, we talked about the technology and the world we're living in. It, there is a seemingly endless supply of entertainment. There's, we, we have more content than we've ever had, you know, not just in podcasts, but in film and TV. And then all the, the Netflix and Hulu's and Amazon Prime and, you know, and then all the millions of books there are. I never take it for granted that someone would say, hey, I will give you a try and I will take some of my life, which is what they're doing, part of their life and invest it in reading your work. I, it means more to me than I can, can ever say. And I really appreciate that. And I appreciate you all being here today. Uh, Jan mentioned, I noticed the guitar. Um, will you share some music with us? You know, I, this is related, you know, everything's related, everything's connected. But when Hurricane Michael hit, I didn't play guitar. And I did, I, someone had to remind me this, uh, remind me of this because I had forgotten, but I did, when I was a senior in high school, I did get a guitar and I think I learned three chords, never learned a song, you know? Uh, so I, I guess I had that experience, but prior to that, I just, I didn't play. And after the storm, my son had an old, I mean, an old like Walmart cheap guitar. And I said, Hey, can I borrow that? And I started playing and I just fell in love with it. and the second day, I think it was about two weeks after the hurricane, the second day that Lights Music in downtown Panama City was open, I went and bought my own guitar. And I have played every day, every single day from then until now, and I absolutely love it. And so Hurricane Michael sort of, you know, gave me that gift. But then the pandemic gave me the extra time to practice and, and, and uh, hopefully improve. Uh, on my YouTube channel, uh, during the pandemic, I did a thing called Sunday Songs, and I was sharing a new song each week as I was learning it. 
and uh, plan to do the second season of that very soon. But anyway, so if you check out my YouTube channel, which I think is Michael Lister Books, I believe, and if you just did a search on YouTube, I think there's um, maybe 12, 10 or 12 songs in that first season, that first series. And you can sort of see my progression, you know, and not only uh, as, a, as a player, but also the recording technology. It starts off, you know, pretty wonky and pretty weak. And hopefully you'll see improvement in both of those aspects as it, as it goes along. Becky yeah. wants to know, how, how did you become spiritual? I think um, it was uh, sort of an eight thing in, in early childhood. Uh, just uh, it, it's, it's re definitely connected to mystery for me and the search for meaning, uh, for answers. <clears throat> Ironically, uh, when it comes to life and spirituality, one of the things you, I think the deeper you go spiritually, the more you learn is to accept the, how few answers there are and you learn to embrace the mystery as opposed to what we do in our books, which is actually trying to solve the mystery. Um, but embracing the mystery is humbling and I think puts us in the right, right place. But so it's been a, it's been a, it's been a, in many ways, an individual idiosyncratic spiritual journey, um, not involved in organized religion. Most of what my spiritual experiences and my mentorship have been, books, you know, have been what I've learned from authors who dug deep into the well of their soul and just, you know, put it on the page. So. And Anne and I both found the author. It's E.L. Doctorow is the, who said that quote, it's like driving a car at night. You never see further than your headlights, but you can make the whole trip that way. And I, I honestly believe that because I said it today, it could be attributed to me, but I think someone said it way before he did. I, I think, like I say, so many writers have used that analogy. I guarantee you can find an earlier, uh, I think, I could be wrong. He's definitely an early, early one, but I wonder if he's the originator. But that's great. And uh, he's uh, definitely a great writer and would be, uh, maybe he did, maybe it did originate with him. Yeah, we'll have to do some more research. <laughs> well, I think. I think that's all of our questions. Did you have anything else you wanted to share with us? Just thank you again. I mean, thank everyone, but thank you in particular for, you know, doing this and all the things you do in the, the community and for support library and, and to support readers, you know, and in this community. So thank you.